This episode of Standard Orbit is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program for the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. Want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Walter Koenig, Chekhov from Star Trek, and you're listening to Trek FM. Risk is our business. It's like nothing we've dealt with before. Golly, Jim, I'm beginning to think I can cure a rainy day. I can't change the laws of physics. Now in standard orbit, sir. Welcome, everyone, to Standard Orbit, Trek FM's original series podcast. I'm your host, Zach Moore, and with me today is... Wow. <laughs> really? Well, I thought we were going to do the podcast today. <laughs> All right, if you insist. <laughs> All right. That could be two episodes then we're talking about. Either Assignment Earth or Cat's Paw. We'll let you decide. <laughs> no, we'll do Cat's Paw. Hi, it's Brandon. <laughs> hey, Brandon. Uh, Halloween, right? It's today. Happy Halloween, guys. All Hallows' Eve, as they said in ye old world. <laughs> uh, we thought it'd be fun to do a commentary on Cat's Paw, one of the uh, much maligned episodes of the original series. Brandon and I did a commentary on And the Children Shall Lead. Uh, not too long ago, and that was a lot of fun to do. And uh, you know, there's just you know, love it or hate it. It's it's there's lots to talk about in these really absurd episodes. So I think it's going to be a fun, uh, fun back and forth here, Brandon. I agree with you. I mean, people always want to talk about the good episodes, and I think it's much more fun to talk about the oh, the ones that fall below the bar. Let's just say it's Halloween, guys. So we're just doing a special supplemental episode here for you, a little little treat for your uh, trick or treat bag. And uh, we're going to be talking about Cat's Paw. I must say, I did rewatch this episode recently in preparation for this conversation. I will say, it's not as bad as I remembered it. So, kudos to you, Robert Block. Author of Psycho. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you want some more goodness for, uh, for Cat's Paw, tune into Melodic Treks, episode 60 that came out last year, where Adam Drozen joined me and we discussed the music for Cat's Paw. And uh, it was a, it was a fun conversation. So that's Melodic Treks episode number sixty. Sounds good, man. Well, everybody, cue up your VCRs, your laserdisc <laughs> players, your reel to reels, uh, your Blu rays, or your streaming services, be it Hulu, Netflix, or CBS All Access. We'll count you down three, two, one, and play. And when we say play, you hit play, and we'll watch the episode along together. You ready, Brandon? Are you watching this on your laser discs? Uh, I would, but we're watching it live stream together on Zoom. <laughs> oh, okay. So on your laser discs, are they one episode aside or what? Yes, they're one episode aside, so I don't have to turn them over oh, until that's good. Uh, the episode's over. So yes, that is my preferred method of watching the original series. I have the complete series on laser disc, and I watch it on my standard definition four by three television, and it just just like when I was a kid. So I love it. <laughs> All right, three, two, one, play. Here we go, season two. This is the first episode produced for season two, right? But it wasn't yes. the first one aired, so... They, they held it back for Halloween. They did, and it's a good thing that they did. Now, <laughs> I'll point out a couple things as we go through this, but I watched this with Aubrey, oh, just over a year ago, I'd say. And, like, you know, as a young kid, there was a couple of times when she was, like, freaked out watching this really? episode yeah so i'll point out there was there was like one or two of them like the cat freaked her out for sure and the witches like when the witches heads mm-hmm. are like floating and stuff like she legit like ran and hid underneath our couch mm. <laughs> it's pretty funny well what they're talking about here is they're talking about how scott and sulu and a character named jackson beam down to this planet together and i think that's how landing parties should be you know 
Like, no big three in, in this landing party. No first officer, no chief medical officer, no captain. But this is probably the only time that happens on TOS. What do you, what do you say, Brandon? Well, that's how they did it in... Uh, well, no, not necessarily, because Riker was always on it in the next generation, right? Mm-hmm. But, but, I mean, it's the 60s, and it's your star of the show's the captain, so of course he's going to go down all the time and, and do all the action and all the fun and, and everything like that. Speaking, oh man! Look at going that down. fall! Look like, at that fall! <laughs> that's like a person too. That's not a dummy. <laughs> Falling like a champion, Jackson, the gold shirt, red shirt, huh? Mm-hmm. Looks like John Leguizamo. <laughs> he does, does, doesn't he? That's a good. That's a good. <laughs> that's a good look alike. Somebody Kirk. tweeted the other day. Somebody tweeted. They're like, "What's your favorite scary movie with like no blood or gore for somebody?" And I tweeted, "The Pest with at John Leguizamo." It's scary that that stuff got made. And John Leguizamo liked my tweet, and then he unliked my tweet. <laughs> He's like, oh, that, that looks bad on my part. Let me unlike that. <laughs> oh, man. So that, that's a compelling uh, hook for the, uh, the opening of the episode. There's a curse on your ship, you know? Yeah, it's not something you normally get. I mean, like, normally this is quite scientifically accurate, this show, with, like, space hands and space Lincolns, mm-hmm. you know? So to get a space curse is, that's not good. Completely out of the question. Uh, so the uh, the opening credits in season two, right? They added the singer, like oh, that's you know, so right. just like her. <laughs> You're gonna say something. <laughs> well, do you prefer the season one music with uh, out the the singer, or the season two music with the singer? Um, I prefer the D Space Nine theme song myself. That's my favorite. <sighs> all right, that's not what I asked. First of all, the the D Space Nine theme, first of all, is the most boring theme. In Star Trek, it's like an endurance test to sit through those opening credits the first three seasons. I'm so glad they updated them. Oh, I know, what? I know you disagree. I know you disagree. We've talked about this before. I'm, I'm, I'm exiting tricks. this commentary. I'm not even finishing this stuff. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think it's more iconic of the two to have the singer in uh, the opening credits. So I do. This is my my preferred version because I also prefer the yellow text over the blue because that's iconic Star Trek. I, I, I don't mind the blue. It's like it's like a good sign to tell like hey what season you're in, but you know the the singer and the yellow opening credits is my ideal uh, opening credits of the original series. Plus you got DeForest Kelly in there too, and he deserves a spot. Zach S two, that's what we'll call you from now on. <laughs> <laughs> so Catspot, as we mentioned earlier, it's written by uh, we saw the, the opening credits there, written by Robert Block from Psycho, and he wrote three episodes of the original series. Hey, I he bet wrote, you I could name him. Uh, oh, go ahead, Brandon. Okay, so I know that he did this, and he did What Are Little Girls Made Of. Mm-hmm. And he did the season two episode with Piglet the Ripper, which is give me a second here. <laughs> Piglet it's, the Ripper, uh, so good. Wolf in the Fold. Yes, correct. Uh, of the three, I think what are little girls made of is by far the best of those three, and that's actually one of my favorite episodes. I would agree. Underrated episode too. Nobody talks about it. We should do a commentary on that one sometime. <laughs> we should do a commentary on Wolf in the Fold. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I, I love Wolf in of... the Fold. Uh, you know, it's. It can be seen as harmless fun, but I can also see why other people don't like it. Mm-hmm. And it has some really weird gender politics in it with Scotty hating women. But we'll, we'll get to that when we get to that. Con- that's a, we'll, we'll file that one away for our next commentary, Brandon. I wouldn't mind doing that one with you. <laughs> so we... We, um, we find we ourselves the, on the planet from Galileo 7. Yeah, they, they do kind of uh, disguise it pretty well, though, I think. I think it's very atmospheric. I, I, I know what they're going for, and I feel like they are achieving what they're going for. It's, like, it's very gray. You have the fog, the fog machine. The fog machines are working on overdrive here. Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever seen The Fog by John Carpenter? I have seen the remake of The Fog starring Tom Welling. Oh, you got to see the original fame. Jamie Lee Curtis, man. <laughs> Who's this guy, DeSalle? It's Assistant Chief Engineer DeSalle. Oh, who that hair. Who was in three episodes himself? Can you name those three episodes that he was in? Uh, he was in Cat's Paw. I know that. <laughs> you got that. He was in... Oh, man. I don't know if I know that. Um, I am guess I know there's a season one episode. Am I right on that? There are two season one episodes. Two season one episodes. So I think he was in... I'm going to just... I'm going to plead ignorance. I don't know. What are they? He was, he was in Squire of Gothos. Okay. And this side of paradise. Okay. And it's nice to see recurring guest stars uh, like him and like Lieutenant Riley and then Dr. Minga. Mm-hmm. But uh, the only reason that he is in charge here is so Uhura wouldn't be in charge of the ship. Because Scotty and Sula are on the planet, mm-hmm. and so are Spock, McCoy, and Kirk now. There's no one left to be in charge. 
And I'm sure there was some behind-the-scenes thing there that said, hey, we can't have Uhura in charge of the ship for multiple reasons in the 60s. So they just gave this guy a promotion to assistant chief engineer because he was a gold shirt before in his first two appearances. Mm-hmm. And now he's in a red shirt. I think he's a fine... I mean, he, he, he this guy is, like, so, like, stereotypical 60s TV star. Like, like square-jawed, you know, superhero-esque-looking <laughs> guy. And he's like, we're going to f- solve this problem, mister. You know, so, I mean, he's fine. And I would like to see him some more, but... Here. This here, man. This totally freaked my daughter out. These three head floating head witches. Now, do you think they're supposed to look headless, or do we, are we supposed to see their total necks? Oh no, they're supposed to just be heads. That's just lighting on the shirts. <laughs> they're wearing black shirts, right? So they're supposed to be just floating heads. Come on, Mike Okuda, you can step your game up on the TOS remastered on that. But they, you know, they did do some good stuff. We'll come up to in a second here, which I really liked on on the remastered version. This is not. No, we're not watching the remaster. This is the original. This is not this is this is not the the uh, the remastered version, so I take it all back. Yeah, but I, but I will say they did some really nice castle updates on the remastered version uh, because I do I do watch the remastered versions on occasion. So. What's wrong with their face? What's wrong with their face? <laughs> uh, you know, I will say that this was a very striking image when I was a kid, though, when they had the end credits. You know, when they show the the uh, still frames of different episodes at the end of the episodes, they they had a witch face. I was like, oh, what's that? Before I saw this episode, it was it was creepy. So I, I I understand why your daughter might have been scared by this. Just, mm-hmm. And they're like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and they talk like this. We should do the rest of the commentary like that. <laughs> I love Spock's analysis are very bad poetry, Captain. Kirk's like, ah. <laughs> Not now, Spock. <laughs> you, you and her smart-ass comments. It was awesome, though. She was legit freaked out. She was hiding under the couch. Wonderful parent, Brandon. We, <laughs> oh, my daughter was so scared. It was so awesome. <laughs> we have a couch that, like, unfolds into a bed, and it was open at the time, and she was, like, right under it. <laughs> <laughs> so they're still wandering around the uh, the, the planet here. They get, they're uh, running into the uh, the winds of uh, Saruman here as they try to <laughs> go on their quest to destroy the ring. <laughs> This is, you know, you see stuff like this and when you're mocking it and whatnot, it just makes me think of Ed Wood when he has to, like, get in the water with that octopus. He's like... He fi- he's moving the arms. Yeah. <laughs> just move, it around, move it around a bit. Uh, so that, see, you know, I don't mind the episode so much at this point. I think there's a certain point where it jumps the shark and becomes, like, a really bad episode. Oh, yeah. And we'll get into that. But at the, up to this point, I think, okay, the witches are a little hit or miss, but, yeah. I think it's the cat, honestly. Like, mo- honestly, most of the episode is not that bad, I-, I don't think. Like, here, all this witch stuff, all this imagery that we're seeing, this castle that we're about to see right away, like, it all really works. And even going in there and dealing with the two aliens, I think, works very well as, as well, right? Right. No, I-, I that's exactly what I was going to say, too, is the cat is really what... When the when they- when they giant little household cat <laughs> becomes the crux of your climax you got a problem but this is something that did improve on the remaster they they had a new map map painting of a uh, or not a map painting but a cgi painting of a castle it really uh expanded the scope mm-hmm. of things and i really think that was a really good little uh little thing they didn't have to fix but they chose to and that's what you know the akutas really literally worked overtime to do those things because that wasn't part of the agreement they're they're their mandate was to fix all these special effects shots in space, and anything beyond that was above and beyond, and I really did appreciate that aspect of the remastered project for TOS. You know, I've still only seen the first season remastered. Like, I've got the Blu-rays, but I just, I personally like watching them with the original effects. I still have to go back and watch. Like, even on my uh, my rewatch last year for, for the 50th anniversary rewatch that we did, I watched them all with the original effects, mm-hmm. and I watched them in mono. Hmm. Well, hey man, I'm, I'm the guy that watches them on, on a laser display, so I, I'm right there with you. But it it is a nice uh, alternative version. Unlike Star Wars, they haven't erased the original versions. You're able to watch both in the highest quality, should you so choose. So you could kind of say that the Blu-rays are an alternative factor. You could say that. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> it sure is taking a while to get to the, inside this castle, though. I must say. Uh, <laughs> I bet when they did syndication cuts, they really cut a lot of this out. In the, uh, <laughs> chopping you off mean their we 50... could cut eight minutes of this uh, this walking into the castle out? Yeah, because well, it was 52 minutes, I think, was the original time. They come down to about 46 or 45, for, and they continue to cut them down as, as TV has continued. There, there's a cat. See, they do the first shot to make you think it's big, because yeah. it's up close, and then it's like really small. And the, I like the Dutch angle on the cat. It's like 
interesting. I don't I don't know what it is, but it's interesting. It's a Batman villain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is like probably the same cat they use in all the Catwoman episodes, you know. <laughs> and, and wonder if that's Isis. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it is. <laughs> There's only one paid cat in Hollywood. It's got its own trailer and everything. Isis is a very different meaning nowadays. It I've, do, I've realized yeah. this because there was, you know, obviously a, a, the Isis is the cat in Simon Earth. There's an episode of Smallville called Isis. Uh, one of the characters on Smallville starts an Isis Foundation. So when I get to talking about those episodes on my other podcasts, I'm going <laughs> to have to comment on that. Yeah, so like the, you know, if the FBI is like scanning your audio files, like you're like high on the list of like. <laughs> potential you know watch lists this guy says isis like three times an hour um so here's a wealthy canning is check off hair this is, is the worst terrible. wig ever of course it was supposed to recreate davy jones and the monkeys who were, were of course uh inspired by the beatles so everything is pop culture kind of eating itself like the snake right this is this is a very ineffectual plot when they're on the enterprise um this shows me why in further episodes they don't always cut back to the ship because you see how boring and useless it is. It's like, we we have to break through this force field. We, we, we've got to keep working. It's like <laughs> it's like every time they do nothing, especially this episode where they literally, and we'll get to it at the end where, where Korob has a line. He's like, I released your ship, but they would have done it themselves eventually. They were they were on a good track. They were, they were doing their work up there. <laughs> it's like to give the crew some credit, but in the classic door closing itself gag. What a gag. Of course, Spock doesn't. Spock, who is a Spock, it's so, so paradoxical. Spock's knowledge, right? Because he he has this encyclopedic knowledge of all history of like all these cultures, yet he doesn't know about trick or treat. He doesn't know about row 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 your boat. <laughs> you know, he doesn't know about marshmallows. <laughs> Would they have trick or treat at this time? Like, I'm sure that you know, being a, a Vulcan, you know, raised on Vulcan, th- he wouldn't be exposed to trick or treat, and then going to Starfleet Academy. You know, like they had like a hollow, special Halloween days to start for the academy. Nobody came and came to school in the costume. Well, I mean, in this day and age, you can't even like have Halloween or Christmas or whatever at work for tolerance, right? And that's now, so I'm guessing. Ooh, no. look at that fall! Oh, that is not that is not how that actually broke. <laughs> and by the way, there's no way they wouldn't have broken some bones in that yes, kind of fall. Look at that with those stones. <laughs> Now are they suspended in the air here? I could like when I watched it before, no. I couldn't really tell. They're they're standing on the ground. Yes, and their arms are chained up. Okay, it looks like in some shots they are being suspended, which would be much more painful. This is an effective like we're talking about. Other than that, pretty cheesy explosion. This is an effective set here. The skeletons. And- now, how does that skeleton hold itself together? Like, why did the bones not just like collapse? Because they went and bought it at a prop shop. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Yes, okay. Well, that answers that question. Uh, I do like uh, Kirk's like, Doc. <laughs> He's about to call him Bones and sees the Bones and calls him Doc instead. He could just call him Leonard. God forbid. How many times now have we seen them, like, chained up? Like, they, there was also uh, Archons, Return of the Archons. They were, like, chained up at one point. And... I know in, uh, well, in season two, I feel like it happens a lot more because, like, in Patterns of Force, I know they are. Weren't they chained uh, up in Archons? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm thinking of this episode, but... Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly in Archons, but I know Bread and Circuses, they probably are, and, uh, or at least they're in jail cells. But the Patterns of Force, I think they are for sure. Uh, maybe Omega Glory. This is them talking about some parallel development Earth, which we haven't even... It's the first episode of season two. We haven't even done much of that yet, um, but they're already throwing it out there. Yeah, all these dungeons look the same with the, you know, the stairs over up in the corner there. Like, it's definitely one set. You can see Scotty's missing finger there. Oh, you can? Yeah. Oh. Look at the Look at the way he's holding the gun. Can you see it? Oh, I see. Okay, I see. Maximize your screen. <laughs> I don't know why James Doohan chose to make an effort to hide it, because I think if, any, if there's any character on Star Trek that would have a missing finger, it would be an engineer. So it would make it would make perfect sense, you know, for him to have a missing finger. I mean, own that, man. That's cool. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe it was, like, sensors. Yeah, like, it's going to creep out the kids. It's like, Mom, he only has four fingers. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> if you, you know, and if you want an in-universe explanation, it could have been when Apollo shocked him in uh, Who Mourns for Adonis. Just throwing that out there for all you for fan justifiers out his there. Finger? Yeah, but you know, I'm just saying, if you wanted to, like, oh, when did Scotty lose his finger in the universe? You know, Apollo shocks him with some lightning, you know, point blank range in that episode. That could have been a reason. Or could he just been messing around with the warp engines and some plasma coil blew up in his hand? You know, who knows? So. But yeah, so Spock mentions that everything they're experiencing here is what terrifies man on a most instinctive level. I don't, I don't know if that's the case, Brandon. What about you? I, I think so. I mean, it doesn't translate well to screen, but I mean, like, dark caverns and darkness where you can't see. Like, I'm still af- not, it's not that I'm afraid of the dark, right? But I don't like going in dark places. And I remember when I was a teenager, th- there was this place, I lived in a little uh, town called LaRange, Saskatchewan, and there was this area, I can't remember the name of the street anymore, but from where I lived to where my friend Matthew lived, there was a path that you could go on. It was a well-defined path, but it wasn't lit very well. So at nighttime when I would go, and it wasn't a very long path, right? But when I would go nice, visit nice him at nighttime, there, by the way. <laughs> it would freak me out to go down this dark path, right? Like I was always very scared of it. And I don't know why. Like I just didn't like going down this path at night. And like, I'm a big man, you know, like even as a teenager, I was a big boy. And I could have gone around it, and it would have, like, quadrupled my time, but I never did, right? Because it would, because literally to follow the road would have taken, like, forever to get around it, just the way that this road was shaped, versus, like, literally, honestly, it was like a two-minute walk through this trail, not even, and it just freaked me out every time I went through it. Well, you're right. The TOS is, it's colorful, it's bombastic, it's theatrical. You know, that doesn't marry well with, let's make a creepy, unsettling atmosphere, and that's why we have this, like, B-grade haunted house feel in this episode, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Right, it doesn't translate well. Like, like horror imagery itself doesn't really translate that well to the screen because when you bring it out in the light, it's silly. But you know, when it's in the darkness, it can be quite frightening, and that's I, that's what I believe, right? It's always what you don't see is scarier than what you do see. Yeah, exactly. The Alfred Hitchcock school of suspense, right, Brendan? Mm-hmm. You know, you know a thing or two about that. One or two, yeah. Speaking of, if you go over to the Fandom Pod- Podcast Network and check out my show, Good Evening, an Alfred Hitchcock podcast that I do with my friends Chris and Tom. There we go. See, we, we got to get our plugs in for our other, <laughs> our other shows. <laughs> and you, I mean, you are one Superman. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh well, you know, it's all, it's all Smallville. I don't know. I was gonna. Couldn't think of it, guys. And this, and this is live, so it's not like I can edit that. So we just got to keep moving forward. Uh, there's no editing these uh, these commentaries. So, what is it with TOS and cats, though? I mean, this episode in Assignment Earth, there's always these like mysterious guys and these black cats. That's the first and the last episode. It's a bookend. It's like it's like the cigarette smoking man going and putting that thing in the in the Pentagon basement. Okay, you know, tangent. Is that not is that not stock footage from the pilot? In the Aramile flask, I'm I'm a hundred percent sure it is. I don't they just think it is. And, and if you guys know the X Files, you know what we're talking about. If you don't, then just spare me this sixty seconds here. Seriously, if you, I think they just shot a new a new insert shot of them putting the alien embryo on the shelf. Instead but other of the than that, silver thing. Yes, and everything else is entirely the scene for the pilot. Go watch them back to back. I think you're right. Oh, maybe. So, Brandon and I also talk about the X Files a lot on the X Cast. You guys should check that out. So that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just keep plugging all of our other stuff. Anyway, back back to TOS here. Um, I like how Spock is talking about here. Um, he's telling uh, McCoy and Kirk about the legends of wizards and their uh, their demonic associates, their familiars, you know. And uh, they, they give Spock that they they, they 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 think it's stupid, and he's like, "I did not create the legend, Captain. I merely report it." So, <laughs> I think that's a good uh, a good line there. Do you think this episode would have been better if it was a musical? Um, I mean, like that—that that thing he has in his hand could be his microphone, and he could just be like <laughs> singing, like goblins and boogeymen. Well, we know uh, we know Shatner and Nemo both have albums and and were right. musician. Well, they they fancy themselves as singers, <laughs> so <laughs> I wouldn't have minded that. With large quotation marks around that, I, I do I, I do like uh, what Korob said there earlier. He says that. Uh, I do not understand that reference. Therefore, it is also of no importance. <laughs> I want to. I want to start saying that when I don't understand stuff. Just start putting it on Facebook after like all the trolls. I do not understand that reference. It is therefore deemed unimportant. 
So he is um so he's trying to bribe Kirk and company here with like jewels and precious metals and whatnot. And much like Trelane and Squire Gothos, apparently these guys have out of date information on Earth. Mm hmm. Um well, so I tell you I, what would get me is that roast he had on there. <laughs> yeah, it's like, all right, fine. Did, what do you want it, me to do? I'll do it. Just give me that roast. Did that remind you of Pan's Labyrinth, though? Uh, like when I've the only little, seen like, it once. Oh, it's good. With a little girl, she's so hungry when she goes to like this banquet hall, and Doug Jones, Saru, is the uh, the man with the hands and the eyeballs, and you can't eat off his table or he comes to get you. That's that's a, the, the food temptation. That was probably the best uh, use of that I've seen in a film or TV yeah. show. Well, and this roast was pretty good looking. And, and speaking of, you know, we, we mentioned Catwoman and Batman and stuff earlier. Uh, Korob here, he kind of looks like uh, King Tut from the Batman show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that little uh, little goatee that sticks out. But do, do, is it supposed to be like a like a like a twist when uh, when the cat comes back in and it's Sylvia? Like, are we not supposed to know? You know, because they were, like, building up this whole, like, oh, the cat's going to leave, and, and oh, look, a woman came back, right? I mean, do you think people were, like, surprised by that? No, but wasn't there, like, a 60s show, like, Bewitched or whatever, where she could, like, turn into a cat? So I'm sure they were all, like, I don't know, maybe it wasn't yeah, Bewitched. Yeah, it was Bewitched but... or I Dream of Genie. Yeah. Maybe it was I Dream of Genie, yeah. <laughs> the 60s is a weird time, man. <laughs> <laughs> Things were strange back then. Oh, man. Yeah, this, uh, you know, I was talking, and I was talking to somebody at one point, I can't remember what, what podcast we were doing, but um, I had said, name me an original series episode that doesn't have a sequel that's been in a novel, and you know what? I don't think Cat's Paws had a sequel in a novel. Well, I, you know, that, that's, I remember you mentioning that, or we've talked about it, Here, here's what I was talking about, where the cat leaves and she comes back. Yeah. And I, you, you mentioned this before, either in a podcast or just in our nerdy conversations. Oh, um, this... is she the cat? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> uh, Kirk's like, oh, hello. Gentlemen, my colleague. She's wearing the same necklace as the cat. Oh, it's what ties it all together, I understand. <laughs> this episode would be perfect for a novel or some kind of tie-in because they come from another galaxy, and they're, they're, they mention the old ones, which they also mention in What Are Little Girls Made Of, which is mm -hmm. Robert Block talking about the uh, Lovecraftian mythology and whatnot. So that, that, that that's a... A bigger tie and they could have done if they had chose to but i think this episode it's like one of those like yeah well let's let's not touch that one again just like the gorgon and and the children shall lead um or we don't we don't talk about lazarus anymore from well the, the gorgon Factor. comes back in some next generation novels he does yeah Gosh. like in uh, the q trilogy there's by greg cox oh did the, oh did you mention that in our last commentary I don't know if I did or not, but uh, Amy Amy did those on literary trek. So the Gorgon comes back. So does quote unquote God from Star Trek Five. He's also in that trilogy of books. Oh, Scott, he punched to the face. <laughs> he just pushes it like that. But yeah, I bet I don't think this one actually has a sequel. Hmm. Come on, David Mack. Yeah, where, where's our old ones tie in? Oh man, we should get who is it? Who writes some? Some significant uh, Cthulhu novels. <laughs> I have no Let's idea. Get them to write a Star Trek book. Now this little trick here, uh, making the Enterprise small and then affecting it, uh, this also happens again in Requiem for Methuselah. And in that one, uh, they like literally use the prop of the Enterprise... <laughs> You know, Kirk like looks in the view screen and they see him all big and stuff. I actually, I actually like this one better. Like that's a cool medallion. Like if they sold that, like I would buy that and like hang it from my rearview mirror in my car. Like, what if they so sold cool. it with a candle? I mean, I don't. I, I would just put the. I would give the candle away like at a white elephant party, but I would keep the Enterprise. <laughs> my wife had a birthday cake and she, because she's at work because she's a Star Trek fan, it had Star Trek on it, and so she gave me like the little cake topper of the Enterprise. I've got it on my. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'll wait for it here. There's going to be some pilot stock footage coming up here. It's either from the cage or where no man has gone before. Probably from really? where no man has gone before. Yeah, wait for it. Yeah, you they did it. The, they did this in season one, and this is kind of like leftover season one, early season two episodes. So wait for it. There it is. That would be yeah. where no man's gone before. Yeah, you, you can tell by the uniforms. Yeah. You know. Come on, Star Trek. <laughs> it's one thing to use stock footage of the ships, but not the people, too. Well, I've never noticed it. I don't know. That's the first time. I only was 
because you told me. That's something I never noticed before. Didn't they know we're going to be sitting here 50 years later analyzing it? <laughs> Look at that hair. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and this is, I think after this, maybe, there's going to be two or three episodes of season two where he has really bad hair. And then after that, it looks a little more natural. Voodoo doll chip. Voodoo <laughs> ship, I guess. Yes, so. So, you know, Shatner, um, he says, uh, telekinesis is wrong. And then that just made me think of, like, sabotage and stuff. So he says, like, telekinesis, or. <laughs> he puts the emphasis on the wrong syllable, as they say. Syllable. Uh, but that's well, just classic Shatner. I don't know if it's Canadian or if it's Shatner, but how do you say telekinesis, Brandon? Telekinesis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you you're correct. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I say sabotage. I say sabotage. You say sabotage. Well, it depends on the situation. It depends on how you're saying it. Sabotage, sabotage. Like when I'm singing along with the Beastie Boys, it's sabotage. <laughs> right. Right. So it all depends on the situation. Where'd McCoy go? <laughs> He's off eating the roast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you need something, Jim? <laughs> Maybe they gave him mint julep to, like, convert him. <laughs> that saying they gotta know. They gotta know what gets him. That's interesting that, you know, ask him about his science and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, uh, this is... The presentation is off here, but I feel like the... I love that reaction shot, by the way, of Korob. <laughs> it's like... A really like wide angle lens, but way too close to him, so it makes an interesting perspective, especially with that eyebrow eyebrow raise. But the um the concepts here are interesting because as we learn these these aliens, Carob and Sylvia, they're they're not humanoid; they're like little um, Fraggle Rock people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, puppets, bird puppets, and uh, uh, and they they're kind of uh, Sylvia especially is kind of like overwhelmed by all this like sensation and feeling and all this stuff that, that her original form could not experience and, and kind of corrupts her because Korob seems like it's just uh, hey we're here to do our mission you're getting off book you know we need to you know, stop messing around with these people and she's really enjoying it relishing it and I think that's an interesting concept to take but hey these aliens that, that are just uh, it's, it's just too much to handle like you know just existing as a humanoid with all the f- feelings both physical and mental and emotional all that stuff and i think that's an interesting concept that i don't know they, they tackle too much in star trek it's usually the other way around you know well that's how i feel when i podcast with you sometimes it's just all these feelings that you well up they just it's so overwhelming zach <laughs> well thank you brandon there's mccoy he was at the there end of the, the table yeah they're at the kids table over there but yeah, this is the continuing, completely ineffective Enterprise plot. They keep cutting. We're going to keep working on it, sir. Oh, sir, are you there? Uh, okay. <laughs> and they saved a lot of money, too. And, so, and, like, you know, episodes like All Our Yesterdays, like, they don't even cut back to the ship at all. We don't even see him beam down. <laughs> so they just like, you know, we can save a lot of money. We don't have to pay James Doohan and Shell Nichols, George Takei. We just don't cut back to the ship. See, I want to have a house with a dining room like this with these, like, angled doors, like these arching doors and stuff. Wouldn't you like that in your house? Yeah, I'll just go to Renfest and experience this once a year. That's fine. Is that like a place where you can go and get like that lamb's leg or whatever? And eat the yeah. Whole leg? You don't have a Renaissance Fair up there in Canada? Uh, not that I know of. There's a place in Moose Jaw. There's a city called Moose Jaw. Believe it or not, there's a city called Moose Jaw, not that far from where I live. And uh, there's, a, I think they have like a restaurant you can go to and do that. They have like special events. I've just mm. never been. Medieval times. Medieval times. Same deal. Assistant Chief Engineer LaSalle. That's probably why I didn't recognize him, because, yeah, he is in a yellow shirt the other time. It's a gold shirt. Mm-hmm. See, Discovery's not canon. Look at this bridge. Discovery doesn't look anything like this. I uh, I have not read the um, the novel where they cross over with the Enterprise, but uh, I'm they pretty, it, it explains a lot of the uh, visual inconsistencies between Discovery and TOS. I have read that book. Mm-hmm. It's like Spock it, commenting on how humans just change their aesthetics and stuff like that. It's an okay book. I didn't mind uh-huh. it. I mean, it's not great. It's subpar for David Mack. He's had better, but... Did you like them addressing the fact of how the Enterprise looks so different than the Discovery? Um, or the, the Shinzu, I should say. <laughs> yeah, than the Shinzu. Um, sure. 
I mean, it's fine, like, because, you, you know, just with one sentence, like with the uniforms where he says, oh, it's, these uniforms were exclusively for the Constitution class. Well, like, with one line, you can just <laughs> shut everybody down, right? And I like that they can do that. That's good. Right. But, you know. You know, we were joking about that skeleton earlier. You can clearly see that it's not a decomposed skeleton. It has the little line across the cranium that they cut to take the brain out. <laughs> so the fake brain. <laughs> yeah, it's like literally one you would find in a doctor's office. See, the interesting thing about Star Trek Continues with Vic Mignogna is he does the the pronunciations of the words that that uh, Shatner does as well. Like, he did it in the... Did you see episode 10 yet? I was, I was just about to watch episode 10, and then you're like, hey, let's do this podcast right now. And I'm like, oh. oh. <laughs> I literally sat down to watch it. <laughs> he says a word. I think it's sabotage, like he says in the episode, so... I'll have to ask you afterwards what you think of it. There's two there's two parts in it that made me laugh, and I don't think they're intentional laughs, but uh, yeah. <laughs> no, he he's a perfect Kirk. Like like if you squint, you think you're watching Shatner's Kirk on the screen. He's amazing. He really captures the essence of being Shatner without being a parody of Shatner, and that is so hard to do. Yeah, well, my wife said that. we were, I had put it on the other night. We're watching it, and my wife's like, wow, he does a really good job. My wife's like, wow, I had never seen this episode of Star Trek before. Oh, wait, this isn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, she knew what I was watching. But yeah, she it, her too. She was like, "Wow, he does a really good job of Shatner." Yeah, he's he's incredible. Um, also, earlier Shatner was mimicking the skeleton there. I wonder if that was like in the script or that was him just getting bored with him being in this dungeon for so long, and <laughs> just doing something interesting with the scene. He kind of positioned his body like that, like his head was tilted the way the skeleton was. So, little, little moments like many, that. Wonder how many takes that took. <laughs> Bones has the uh, the crazy eyes from uh, City on the Edge of Forever here. <laughs> Assassins! Murderers! <laughs> he just doesn't have the lesions on his face and Killers! The, the pale skin. Right. Why don't their pants go down to their ankles? Because they're wearing boots. No. Oh. Okay. There you go. Take that, hater. No. <laughs> Why doesn't the bridge look the same? Why are their pants go down their ankles? <laughs> this isn't Star Trek. This is interesting. We don't often get this. This is a, a scene between the two, uh, you know, just aliens that are talking to each other. Like, you get their perspective outside of Kirk's perspective of them. Well, we got a uh, balance of terror. Well, I was just going to say, it kind of reminds me of balance of terror, you know. <laughs> Way like, ahead of you, more. Way yeah. ahead of you. <laughs> but, yeah, it's just, I mean, you were kind of talking about the, the room here, the dining room. It just looks like they went to the prop room. <laughs> And just picked any grab that. random thing. Oh, like, man, that would be great. You should oh, grab that, man. Don't leave that behind. <laughs> Look at that chair. Bring that in here. Because <laughs> he's like wearing like an Egyptian. There's that There's that camera angle again. <laughs> I have the power. Oh, I love this cloak. Can I just take this cloak? Oh, look weird. at this eye on here. Like, that's so subtle. Like, people will be de- debating that for the next 50 years with this Yeah, this stuff means. like does not match. There, there's eclectic and then there's this. And <laughs> this does not match. Why is it pink? Well, you know, you could always the, the the whole thing in two as is. Oh, the aliens don't quite properly understand the way things are supposed to be, like Inspector of the Gun or something like that. Or the oh, the, they didn't know we had walls on our buildings. It's an incomplete memory, Captain. <laughs> so silly. We had fifty dollars to spend on this budget, Captain. You know, earlier uh, she did say, "I'm not a puppet," which is ironic because they are puppets. I thought that was a little funny, uh, <laughs> unintentional irony there in the, oh, in the script. Zach. I definitely had more fun laughing at And the Children Shall Lead. Yeah, you know, because you watch this episode and it's like, it's not as absurd, it's not as terrible as you think it is. At the end, the climax is really where it all falls apart. Mm-hmm. Uh, but up to this point, it's like, okay, this is pretty standard TOS, you know? Yeah. And Children of the Lead is just nonsense. <laughs> it's just complete garbage. <laughs> so, I mean, Cat's Bob, would you really rank it in the bottom of TOS? I feel like it's on a lot of people's worst of lists. I would definitely put it pretty low on the list. Like, it's not a terrible episode, but it's not good either. I mean, like, it's pretty slow. I think I think it's a pretty slow episode. Right. What do you think? Yeah, like, we were saying, like, it took them forever to get in the castle. Now they've gone back and forth in a dungeon, like, two and a half times now. Where we're getting... Sl- and this is kind of trotted ground already, right? Stuff like with Trelane, right? We've seen this kind of stuff before, so... Peeping Tom... Yeah. <laughs> How does it feel? 
Yeah, but I don't know. It, like, it's a, it's not a good episode. It's not terrible, but it's not very good. Mm-hmm. See, now this this is Kirk. This is Kirk doing what Kirk does, and becomes the stereotype of him. But he's he's using he's seducing her like to as a means to an end. That's right. To get in, to get information, and all that. So that's that's smart. You know, it's like there, there's there's a there's a reason he's doing what he's doing here. He, and he and he can analyze the situation and use it to his advantage. He can see how she's like getting all cut up in these emotions, and he's just gonna overpower her with them. So, put on that Kirk charm. Yeah, because but most people just think he just kisses people just because he's a romantic or whatever. And <laughs> no, he's definitely always trying to, you know, gain and advance the plot and uh, and uh, save his crew when he's doing it. And if there's certain benefits to that, then you know. So except for except for uh, Edith Keeler, right? Right. And uh, Miramani. 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 <laughs> what is that? Miramani. <laughs> is that is that how I said it? <laughs> That's how you say it usually. Miramani. Miramani. <laughs> <sighs> now, why wasn't why wasn't this lady in the white iris? <laughs> That's that's the worst episode of Continues, by the way. I don't I don't really like White Iris. Vic Bignana, if you could stop listening five seconds ago, please. <laughs> Look, Vic, I love all your work. <laughs> that's, but that episode is my least favorite. No, I is. disagree. I didn't like the one with the rock man. Oh, that one? I thought that was interesting. I think that's my least favorite. With the, what do they call him? Oogly Oosty. or something? Oosty. Oosty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, those are the, those are the, the weakest two episodes so far but I love the last two have been really good well I was about to watch the last one but someone now wanted to do a podcast right now well I'll let you know it's really good (laughs) so um these outfits here she looks like terrible genie here terrible no I'll tell you what's terrible I'll tell you what's terrible terrible. this 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 this? she's like a a sumo wrestler I don't know (laughs) it's terrible it's the worst thing she tried to seduce him in that that's terrible you like what you see hell no I don't like what I see yeah I saw that on my couch Oh my gosh! I saw that on my parents' couch. Aaron Aaron, Har- Aaron Harvey's couch in the uh, wood panel den. He's like, quit changing your clothes and just kiss me. <laughs> See, like here, like you can tell he's totally not interested, right? Like right. the way he's looking around. And she picks up on it too, eventually here. Yeah. Which is great. I'll, I like that. I remember the first time I tried to kiss a girl, and it was like this, and we were just like rubbing faces like this, and it was like, <laughs> I swear, what are you, you doing? To, <laughs> you try to learn how to kiss people by watching television. <laughs> you're in bad shape. I mean, I've done it myself. Where it's like, oh, this is what you're supposed to do, right? This is how you kiss Kirk kisses. He's just like, <laughs> you don't eat people's faces. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. My cheeks aren't pushed into my chin far enough yet. While I'm kissing you. <laughs> oh man. You hold in your arms, and there is no fire in your mind. You're trying to deceive me. Who's here? I don't know. She's holding that necklace, like. That has no significance, though, because uh, the wand that uh, Korob has is the true power. This the is transmuter. The <laughs> transmuter. That's what they call it. It's the transmuter. I know. I, I know. I've seen the episode once or twice. <laughs> wand with a light bulb at the end of it. His microphone. <laughs> yeah. It's like one of those 70s game show microphones, just a little bigger. The Price is Right microphone. Nice. <laughs> Back to the dungeon. Ugh. No, back to the ship. Back to the ship. And then we go back to the dungeon. Ugh. Anyway, they're still at it. You know what's funny is I just finished reading today the book, Uhura's Song. Hmm. And there's all cats in it, right? And so here's Uhura. And the episode's called Cat's Paw. Again, TOS with the cats, right? They have MRS on the animated series. Like, I get it, man. I'm more of a dog person, so. Are you? Well, no yeah. supervillain ever had a dog, right? Name me uh, one supervillain that had a dog. The Grinch. Yeah, but that's not really his dog. <laughs> You're the first person to ever actually be able to tell me one, so. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. 
Congratulations, Zach. And well, you know what else? There's, there's a round of applause we're probably done in the stupid dungeons, like our fourth time in there. So. Yeah, yeah but and he's giving them their phasers. <laughs> this is where Korov is like, although they would have freed themselves soon. I'm like, sure, give them some credit up there. You were kissing her, and I want to kiss her, so you get out of here. It's like, so you guys like together, or what? <laughs> What's your deal? What's the, what's the arrangement here? Oh, man, we should totally do a Patreon bonus where we, like, rewrite the episode and on mute, and so then when they watch along, we just, like, say the character's words, but silly. <laughs> Is that what they do in Mystery Science Theater? I've never seen it, actually. You've never seen Mystery Science I've Theater? never seen it. All right, as soon as you're done here, and then you're done with your next podcast, because I know you're doing one after this, go watch an episode of Mystery Science Theater immediately. It's hilarious. Is that what they do, or do they just do commentaries? Is it basically just commentaries? Well, yeah, there's the three little cutouts of the guys at the bottom of the movie screen, mm-hmm. and they're ta- they're commenting on what's happening. But yeah, sometimes they fake characters' voices and stuff, but it's not an overdub job, if that's what you mean. Oh, okay. Look, another skeleton. <laughs> Man, they really raided that doctor's office. Whoa! Oh, look how big that cat is. Holy crap. This is that where it really is starts huge. to go downhill here. That's a massive cat. Like, how could they possibly have done that special effects back in the days? And it's also, like, slow motion, too. Yeah. It's like... Spock's like, am I really in this episode? The cat is the most ruthless and most terrifying of animals. Sure it is, Spock. Maybe on your planet. <sighs> Well, I mean, like, it's not the cat, but, like, lions, right? Like, is what I always... Saber-toothed tigers, yeah. Extrapolate from that. Cat is a member of the lion family. You know, sort of. (laughs) Yeah, so the climax spent running from this cat is really what sinks the episode in my book. (laughs) The last ten minutes of it, basically? (laughs) Yeah, seriously. Like, it takes it so long, and then this is what we did. Look at this. Look at how big it is! Oh, my goodness! That's like a clip out of a Code O'Brien sketch from Late Night. It's just so cheesy. It is too. <laughs> oh, here comes the giant cat. Oh, God, they're back in the dungeon. I thought we were out of there. Or it might be a different room. They're just saving budget. I don't know. Oh, it is a different room, I guess. No, I don't know. Uh, uh, could, did they have that escape attempt in the dungeon the whole time? No, this must be a different. Uh, it's the hallway. Oh, yeah, and then when the cat kills him. Legit. That was a that was a freeze frame as well, talking about freeze frames, like of the witch earlier. Like, that's a that's a freeze frame, I know, on the at the end credits. Um, luckily, we have this bed over here that Kirk can use to jump up. Um, <laughs> that, that's, a free, that's a freeze frame right there, too. You and your end credits feast fame. How many times did you watch the... Did you just rewind the end credits and watch them over and over? <laughs> well, I, I enjoy... I just really enjoyed that that aspect of TOS. Where, like, it was like, here, here are all these episodes you may or may not have seen. Little glimpses at other adventures. So. I'm just going to randomly draw images... One of the skeleton images from, like, the episodes and just create a gif for you. You should. You should. Make me uh, make me say what they are. We'll do that at the end here. We'll call we'll call out what the end credits, what episodes they're from. <laughs> Kirk's like, uh, this looked important. Nice catch, Spock, by the way. Good editing. Those Vul- Vulcan reflexes. That's true. Good editing, yeah. Oh! <laughs> you know how short that shot was? Like, <laughs> the Kirk must not... Or Shatter must not have been able to hold on, hold on very long. Oh! I'll forget these guys. And this is the other reason this episode is lame. This fist fight with, like, McCoy, Spock, Who? and... Uh, yeah, but look at the guy. It's, like, not even McCoy. It's yeah, like... this is, like, space seed, mirror, mirror level of bad sun doubles here. <laughs> well, no, like, it's Tasha Yar in Encounter Farpoint. Like, that's a whole other level. Uh. <laughs> that's short dude with, like, the bad wig. Kung Fu Sulu. He's no match for Kirk Fu, though. Like, if I were George Takei, he'd be like, you, re- you guys are really going to have me do Kung Fu. <laughs> Who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> it's not even, even Takei. Well, George Takei, like, he, uh, in uh, Naked Time, like, they wanted to give him a samurai sword. And he was like, no, 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 just because I'm Asian, don't give me that. I-, I, wanted to be- I wanted to be Robin Hood, and I was like, give me a, you know, a fencing sword, you know. And that's what they gave him. So whenever they're like, hey, Lee, Sulu's Asian, let's have him do Kung Fu. It's like, really, guys? Come on. <laughs> well, at least we found them. 
I definitely think that this episode is better than And the Children Shall Lead, but it's not as good as... Oh, what's another? I, I don't know. I think Wolf in the Fold's better than this. I agree. There's more locations anyway. Mm-hmm. There's more, more going on. And you see, get to see Piglet be possessed by the spirit of Jack the Ripper. I mean, that's pretty cool. I would say this is probably in my bottom five. Bottom five? Wow. This When Brandon says something in his bottom five, you know it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is probably... It, it might be the worst episode of season two. Uh, I mean, Assignment Earth... I barely even count that as a Star Trek episode. But yeah, it's well. I'll have, I'll have to I'll have to think. I have to meditate on that. But uh, I, have the transmuter. Mine now. I mean, we're talking to a shadow of a cat. <laughs> what are we doing here, guys? Back, you shadow, back. <laughs> oh man. Oh, it's her! Oh, she's that. Cat. She was the cat. Oh, what she a twist! What a twist! Okay. Don't let her touch the water, like Captain. Is she Odo? No. Oh. Is she the female changeling? No. Where'd they go? <laughs> well, yeah. Now that we've removed Spock to tell Kirk what to do, what will he do? And, and such such cheap and again with any of these episodes of like spirits or magic or whatever and, and I'm talking about anything like not just Star Trek but any fiction there's no rules that are established so anything could happen so the stakes are like what are the stakes I don't even know what the stakes are mm-hmm. here because these they could do anything and you could resurrect things and, and he's gonna destroy this wallet and everything goes away and it's like I guess McCoy it's Sulu and Scotty go back to normal they don't even remember anything but Jackson is still dead as Kirk will remind us at the end of the episode. You're not even a woman. I don't know what you are. I like indignant Kirk. Oh, she's got the phaser. That's oh. convenient. So how high would you put this then if you don't think it's like bottom five? Where would you put it? I don't know. I'm just... Uh... Oh! <laughs> bottom ten. Bottom ten? Yeah. I mean, because End the Children Shall Lead's down there. Uh, light, I, you like Lights of Zatar, though. I, <laughs> I was going to say Zatar. Lights of Zatar's down there. <laughs> I'll turn, your top five or my bottom five. <laughs> no, fact, I know Lights that's not true. I know, I know. We joke. So, now, I went to a convention at Vegas, and there was people cosplays as these things. Yeah, like full-size cosplay of these little things. Oh, look, you got to give TOS credit. They made some alien aliens, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean... Clearly, it's not like that's you're getting a cold. Like while we're talking, you, you're like <laughs> developing a cold. <laughs> I need to blow my nose, but this is a live, <laughs> this is a live commentary. So well, I just can't mute do your it. thing. I can handle it for like it's ten okay. seconds. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta hold it together, guys. Hold it together. <laughs> I'm giving it all she's got, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. They did do very weird aliens, but like now, what happens? Are they like melting? Like, <laughs> yeah, like oh, we should study them. Oh no, they're dead. Oh, okay, let's go. Oh no, they're melting. <laughs> <laughs> what a world what a world and Kirk has to remind us that Jackson is still dead because the guy died at the end of the episode and, uh, and that's the end and, th- and this is uh, you know I-, I hadn't seen this episode in a while before we re watched it that I was waiting for like some Spock, Kirk and McCoy seat on the bridge at the end nope <laughs> just nothing okay, now, what was the curse that was put on the ship <laughs> <laughs> good, good point right okay so that is from Miri that's from Who, Who Mourns for Adonis That's her Bowser Bowser Terror. Terror. That's the easy one. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, Metamorphosis? Uh, yeah, Metamorphosis, yeah. That uh, one where they do anything. the thing? <laughs> Maybe, yeah, it's Enemy Within or Spacey. It's just Probably a shot of engineering. Thing. Yeah. Devil, Devil in, in the Dark. dark. Corporate Maneuver. Actually, none, because we never actually saw that image, because <laughs> all of them were all, like, warped and, like... There, there, there are a few uh, images in there, because this is my, my obsession, apparently, as you put it out, that, that aren't actually screenshots from TOS. It's very interesting to, to pick those out, but... Uh... 
Anyway, well, that was that was obviously not quite as fun as the Children Shall Lead, but hey, if, it's, if this is, if there was ever a Halloween Star Trek episode, that was it. And since today's Halloween, we wanted to just celebrate it with you guys talking about the Halloween episode of Star Trek: Cat's Paw. Well, f- bottom fire for you, Brandon. I'll have to look over the episodes again, in, but you know, TOS. But it's probably my bottom ten. So. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely bottom five for me. So. <laughs> well, Colin, well, well, thanks for taking the time. It's always fun to talk uh, Trek with you, Brandon. Thanks for having me on, and uh, I like doing the bad episodes. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we should, Ken doesn't want to do the bad ones, you just call me. We should we should do Wolf of the Full Decks. I think that's a good suggestion. Yeah, I love that episode. Let, let's do the Robert Block trilogy. Let's do let's do Wolf of the Full and then What Are Little Girls Made Of? So, Sounds look, good. So What, what Are point, Little Girls Made Of is a great episode. You I know, know I, I read the book Double Double before I saw the episode. Really? Yeah. Cool. Well, no, we should totally, yeah. So, so Brandon and I, that'll be our thing at some point. If Kid can't be here, Brandon will fill in and we'll, we'll do some commentary on some episodes. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, Brandon, if people want to find you out there on the internet, man, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter, at Brandon Metella. You can find me here on the network with a show called The Edge, which is all about Star Trek Discovery. You can also find me on Warp 5 with my friend Floyd, uh, where we talk about Star Trek Enterprise, and we're having lots of fun over there. Over on the Fandom Podcast Network, you can find me on Good Evening, an Alfred Hitchcock podcast with my friends Chris and Tom. And uh, otherwise, you can find me eating roasts. Alien roast. <laughs> well, when I'm not dangling my model Enterprise over a candle, uh, you can find me here on uh, Stand in Orbit every week talking about TOS with Ken. Uh, you can find me on Always Hold On to Smallville, which is my podcast where we talk about each and every episode of that Young Superman show. We're on Twitter at Always Smallville with one S. And you can find me personally on Twitter at Moron Zach. That's M O O R E O N Z A C H. All right, guys. Well, happy Halloween. Be safe out there, trick or treating. And... <laughs> and... Oh, oh, oh. Enjoy the podcast. Be safe out there tonight. <laughs>